they're basically vacuuming up everything. Okay, President Obama, in a fantastically wonderful phrase, said that, you know, this is a reasonable compromise between freedom and security. All this stuff the government's doing, this is a reasonable compromise. Folks, I don't understand how, I mean, if you pay attention to what the government is doing and what this whistleblower said and what other whistleblowers have said, that as far as we know, right, we don't know, I mean, this latest whistleblower said that they can turn on remotely, uh, I believe he said, wasn't, didn't he say, Ben, you could turn on remotely your cell phones and your webcams and all that stuff and listen if they want to. I don't understand how you can call all credit card data from everybody, all website traffic, all phone calls, all texts, all emails, all travel data, all credit reports, all library books checked out, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How's that a reasonable compromise? Isn't that virtually everything? That's like giving up everything and saying, well, we're both happy with the deal. You gave me everything and uh, I gave you security, right? Did you? Are we totally secure now, now that you've taken everything? Um, back to the story, though. Let's talk about this Edward Snowden guy, because what he's done appears to be both heroic. I was proud of the USA Today Today editorial staff admitting that this guy is almost certainly a hero, because the definition of a hero is someone who is willing to sacrifice everything for a more, you know, a higher cause. And that's what this guy did. 29 years old on his way to a dream life, most of us would think, right? Already making $200,000 a year, sharing a house in Hawaii with his girlfriend. This guy could have cruised. He's given it all up, and let's make, um, let's make no mistake that he has given it all up. He will be very lucky to not serve decades in prison for this. And the government is going to come down on him like you can't believe. Murderers will get away easier than this guy will, okay? I'm sorry, folks, that's heroic. You may think that's a traitor, but that's heroic. You you want people in government who have morals and ethics. You know, there's a line from President Bush, and it's actually in this clip that we're going to use at the end of today's program, where he says, listen, the, the safeguard, I'm paraphrasing, but the safeguard you really have with all these programs is people that, you know, have a good sense of the law working for us, right? If something was wrong, you know, they they know about it. I mean, these people are ethical. Well, this person is ethical. He's not doing this for gain, as he said in the Guardian piece. If he wanted to sell this information to foreign entities, he could get bloody rich doing it. He doesn't get anything releasing it to us. Now, I'm sorely tempted to simply, I mean, you want to just read this whole Guardian article. I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to read more than I normally do. I want you to go read them, though, folks. This is history. This is media history. Go read each one of them in order, and you are reading. I mean, you want to know what it feels like to be involved in Woodward and Bernstein and Watergate as it unfolds? Well, this may not be Watergate, but it's top 10 of the stories in our lifetimes, depending on how old you are, since then, okay? I will read some of it because... I want to show what a genius this guy is. It's almost as though he, we'll use a Bush word here, strategized how he was going to do this whole thing to avoid the same sort of pitfalls that people who've done something similar before him have fallen into, right? He watched Drake, he watched Binney, he watched Bradley Manning, and he watched how the government responded and the arguments that opponents to all this used against them. And, you know, for example, I mean, on the Bradley Manning thing, everybody was slamming him for endangering operatives in the field, right? So Snowden deliberately doesn't release information that would endanger people in the field. I mean, he's crafted the whole way he's done this to minimize the ability of the government to demonize him. And he knows that's going to happen anyway, but assume, we can assume it's going to be in some new novel way because he's managed to build a kind of firewall protecting him from the approaches the government has used on other whistleblowers. He's also done it in such a genius-like way that if the government comes down on him, and they have to, because if they don't, he's not going to be the last. You're going to have a bunch of other people who probably have been itching to do something similar and have been feeling, oh, this isn't right, maybe I should come out, it's not right. If he doesn't get hit with a ton of breaks, they're going to turn, right? They're going to flip. They're going to come over to our side. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, it isn't entirely, you know, it's, a, it's not the government and us now. It's the government or us. They're going to come over to our side. And the government can't have that. The problem is they're going to look like they're coming down on a hero, like a guy who sacrificed his entire life for an, a cause that both right and left-wing Americans revere. 
our constitutional protections and freedoms. And if you're the government prosecuting a guy who gave up his entire cushy, wonderful life to protect our constitutional freedoms, what does that portray the government as? He might as well be King George III, although King George III's um, country is the one who broke this story. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's some interesting ironies going on, ladies and gentlemen, right now. But let me read you a little bit of this, and I apologize. But like I said, you ought to go read it yourself. It's, it's, it's groundbreaking journalism. The piece is entitled... Edward Snowden, the whistleblower behind the NSA surveillance revelations by Glenn Greenwald, Ewan McCaskill, and Laura Poitras in Hong Kong from The Guardian's online edition, Sunday, June 9th, 2013, from the piece, quote, The individual responsible for one of the most significant leaks in U.S. political history is Edward Snowden, a 29-year-old former technical assistant for the CIA and current employee of the defense contractor Booz Allen Hamilton. Snowden has been working at the National Security Agency for the last four years as an employee of various outside contractors. The Guardian, after several days of interviews, is revealing his identity at his request. From the moment he decided to disclose numerous top-secret documents to the public, he was determined, the story says, not to opt for the protection of anonymity. Quote, I have no intention of hiding who I am because I know I have done nothing wrong. End quote. Later on in the piece, he says he understands that he will be made to suffer for his actions, but, quote, I will be satisfied if the federation of secret law, unequal pardon, and irresistible executive powers that rule the world that I love are revealed even for an instant, end quote. By the way, in this piece, Snowden points out, and the, and the government must absolutely shudder when they read this, that all of these safeguards and protections that they've told us, we don't need to worry about any of this stuff because it's all in there, isn't in there. And he knows because as a mid-level, low mid-level guy, he points out that he could have accessed any of your data at any time. Okay? Forget all this. we got to get a, a FISA court. Blah, blah, blah. No. He could do it. Okay? This is why the government's got to drop the hammer on him because he's exposing exactly how reckless and – listen, John Dean – John Dean, who was the lawyer for the Nixon administration when the whole Watergate thing went down, uh, had an interesting tweet today, and I retweeted it. He said that those who think the National Security Agency is somehow immune from the normal government bureaucratical nonsense and ineptitude and incompetence should know that it's no different than the IRS. Okay, all that stuff you read about the IRS and you realize how incompetent and how much bureaucracy there is and how they have a helpline at the IRS that if you call the helpline and they help you with your taxes, they have a rule that says that they're not beholden to what they told you because they can be wrong. I mean, folks, the NSA might as well be the same group of people. I mean, when you think that these are all highly trained, you know, super computer geek, I mean, this guy didn't even have a high school education, folks. He didn't complete high school. That's not to slam him. It's just to maybe puncture some of these myths on who we're dealing with here. It's a giant government agency like all the others. It has the benefits and the drawbacks of all the others. It might as well be the IRS as far as their ability to be right all the time, to be honest, to be above political you know, dynamics and all that other stuff, right? John Dean ought to know. He used to be the top, one of the top attorneys in the U.S. government in an administration that was fond of using all of these levers and tools and weapons against their political opponents. He says later in the piece, quote, My sole motive is to inform the public as to that which is done in their name and that which is being done against them, end quote. He points out that he's willing to sacrifice his cushy life, he says, because he can't in good conscience allow the U.S. government to destroy privacy, Internet freedom, and basic liberties for people around the world with this massive, I'm quoting here, surveillance machine they're secretly building, end quote. He says that this is not an altruistic move. It's a self-interested one because he doesn't want to live in the kind of world that we are almost at and that we will be going very soon past the point of no return, which brings us to another interesting question about whether you could walk this thing back if you wanted to from where we are now which gets us to the FISA court and a bunch of things we're going to talk about later in the program. I was trying to think about what I could bring to this story um, that isn't already being brought by these people doing wonderful investigative work. And I thought, well, we'll bring some context and we will point out how many of the things that are being used to make us feel better about these programs are, in fact, fig leaves that do nothing of the sort and always were. 
He said uh, in the story he expects to be prosecuted under the Espionage Act, which is a ridiculous 1917. I mean, folks, when I was growing up in the 1970s, we thought the 1917 Espionage Act was akin to the laws that allowed Japanese Americans to be locked up in camps for the duration of the Second World War as far as things that ought to be st struck from the books as a black mark in U.S. history. We've resurrected it and we use it to go after Americans now. It's it's you wouldn't have believed it in the 1970s if somebody had said that. Uh, the article goes into his background. He was a soldier trained for special forces. Um, the story says this about when he first decided maybe he needs to go public with this. And it was back during the latter part of the Bush administration when he was um, working in Geneva, Switzerland. The story says this, quote, he said it was during his CIA stint in Geneva that he thought for the first time about exposing government secrets. But at the time, he chose not to do so for two reasons. First, he said, quote, most of the secrets the CIA has, where he was working at the time, are about people, not machines and systems. So I didn't feel comfortable with disclosures that I thought could endanger anyone. Secondly, the election of Barack Obama, the story says, in 2008, gave him hope that there would be real reforms, rendering disclosures unnecessary. He left the CIA in 2009, the story says, in order to take his first job working for a private contractor that assigned him to a functioning NSA facility stationed on a military base in Japan. It was then, he said, that he, quote, watched as Obama advanced the very policies that I thought would be reined in. And as a result, he said, I got hardened, end quote. The primary lesson, the story says, from this experience was that, quoting Snowden here, quote, you can't wait around for someone else to act. I had been looking for leaders, but I realized that leadership is about being the first to act, end quote. Folks, I'm sorry. You may disagree with what this guy did, but what makes a hero are motives. This guy had the highest of motives in mind to protect the ideals that we were all raised with. You may argue about violating security clearances or all these other things, but folks, how else are we going to know about this stuff? Isn't there more of a value sometimes in knowing what your government is doing than the value of what the programs that the government is doing stuff with are supposed to do? I mean, he says, quote, the NSA, paraphrase, the NSA, the NSA are intent on making every conversation and every form of behavior in the world known to them, end quote. He said that what they're doing poses, quote, an existential threat to democracy, end quote. Here's another quote from The Guardian, quote, As strong as those beliefs are, there still remains the question, why did he do it? Giving up his freedom and a privileged lifestyle. Quoting Snowden now, quote, There are more important things than money. If I were motivated by money, I could have sold these documents to any number of countries and gotten very rich. For him, the story says, it is a matter of principle. Quote, The government has granted itself power that it is not entitled to. There is no public oversight. The result is people like myself have the latitude to go further than they are allowed to, he said. End quote. Again, the story continues. I encourage you to go read the entire piece, all of them. Quote, Snowden said that he admires both Daniel Ellsberg and Bradley Manning, but argues that there's one important distinction between himself and the Army private, whose trial coincidentally began the week Snowden's leaks began to make news. Quote, I carefully evaluated every single document I disclosed to ensure that each was legitimately in the public interest, he said. There are all sorts of documents that would have made a big impact that I didn't turn over because harming people isn't my goal. Transparency is. End quote. You know, folks, again, um, as we've said on this program before, if you are a stickler that you never violate your um, security clearance, then we don't have a Binny, we don't have a Drake, we don't have this guy. In other words, all this stuff we now know about what's going on in our name secretly all around the world, we don't know any of it. So you have to weigh this you know, iron law that you never violate security clearance by how important the information we've gotten because people did violate their security clearance is. You expect to have people who actually believe in upholding their oath of office. We, folks, look, look, look at it this way. Ron Wyden, the senator who's been trying to tell us about this for a long time, takes an oath of office to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States when he is sworn in. He also 
not so much an oath, but he's also sworn to secrecy as a member of the Intelligence Committee. Which of those two oaths or restrictions should take precedent? Okay? Is the one to the Constitution of the United States and to the people higher or lower than the one to protect the secrets as a member of, you know, the Intelligence Committee? If those two things contradict each other, which side should he fall on? This guy was not supposed to release these secrets. And at the same time, he thought that the secrets contained information which will lead to the destruction of our democracy. What is the higher calling there? And let's do it another way. Look at it from this, this perspective. Think about all the people that are making the decision on the opposite side of the coin. They think this might lead to the destruction of democracy, but I can't say anything because I'm, I, 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 I have a security clearance. Is that the right way to say it? If they really think it's going to destroy the ideals of America, but I can't do it, I have a security clearance. Is that the right decision to make? Where would we all be if everybody made the decision, you know, that way? You know, you have to look at history, folks. If we have no whistleblowers, Richard Nixon finishes out his term in office. There's never a church and pike committee hearings. I mean, the stuff that we know about reality today because people were willing to violate their security clearance and turn over stuff that the government didn't want them to turn over is huge. When you argue against people doing that, you're arguing against overturning huge chunks of reality that would otherwise be hidden from view. Is that really worth the potential damage that was supposedly done to national security? As I've said before, I'm 100% behind the leaker of this information. I've been consistently supportive of those who act as whistleblowers for exposing what the surveillance state, for lack of a better word, is doing in secret without consulting the public, who are, of course, the ones who are supposed to be making these decisions. This is all stuff that I consider to be um, our right to know as part of being informed Voters, the people that run the country, have to know enough about reality to make halfway decent and informed decisions at the ballot box. Otherwise, this whole thing is a farce. How can we blame voters for how they vote if they don't know crucial stuff like this? Well, Dan, ultimately, it's the voters who are responsible for the way things are. Only if they know about the way things are. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, if I pretend we live in Oz... And that's all I tell the voters, and then they vote like we live in Oz. Can you really blame them for the way they vote? These people are pulling back the curtain and showing you that the wizard ain't the wizard. He's an old, befuddled little man who's pretending that he's on top of this and that he's adhering to the Constitution and that you don't have to worry. There's tons of oversight, and everybody's briefed, and we're not spying on Americans. Folks, this is the sort of stuff that Senators Ron Wyden and Udall and people like them were trying to tell us about. And here's the part that, that blows me away, because you'll hear some of these people on the Senate Intelligence Committee, like Dianne Feinstein and Saxe Chambliss and all these people say, well, Harry Reid, there's nothing wrong. We've been doing this for seven years. Nobody's complained. You're all getting your panties into an uproar over this whole thing. It's no big deal. Well, people have been complaining. The problem is, is that the people that know about this are not allowed to tell you about it. So how can they complain? This idea that we brief Congress, and you'll hear President Bush in, in the bite from the um, clip that we chose for the end of the program, um, the flashback clip, you'll hear him say the same thing. We brief Congress on this. No, they don't. We told you this a few shows ago, and thankfully a bunch of stories have broken on that since, pointing out that briefing Congress is a meaningless term because they don't brief Congress. They brief the Intelligence Committee, who's then not allowed to tell anyone about what they were briefed about. You know, they can't even tell other congressmen. And the briefing is the most bare bones kind of thing, all right? So Ron Wyden, and I'm going to quote his entire statement that he made, trying to warn Americans that at some point what the government was doing behind our backs is going to come out and we are going to be stunned and appalled. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We're here. Quote, when the American people find out how their government has secretly interpreted the Patriot Act, they're going to be stunned and they're going to be angry. And they're going to ask senators, did you know what this law actually permits? Why didn't you know before you voted on it? The fact is, Wyden said years ago, 
Anyone can read the plain text of the Patriot Act, and yet many members of Congress have no idea how the law is being secretly interpreted by the executive branch, because that interpretation is classified. It's almost as if there were two Patriot Acts, and many members of Congress have not read the one that matters. Our constituents, of course, are totally in the dark. Members of the public have no access to the secret legal interpretations, so they have no idea what their government believes the law actually means." End quote. When Wyden says that many members of Congress have no idea how the law is being secretly interpreted, how does that jibe with the government saying, we brief Congress? No, they don't. They brief Wyden and Udall and Feinstein and Chambliss and the people on the Intelligence Committee who are not allowed to tell anyone else. Folks, there's eight people on the Intelligence Committee. When those same people say, well, nobody's complained about any of this, Sachs Sachse Chambliss said, nobody's complained about any of this. Well, B.S. Wyden has, Udall has. I mean, that's 20% of your Intelligence Committee right there. Feingold did, but they can't tell you because they're sworn to secrecy. They tried, though. My favorite attempt at trying happened on March 12, 2013, when Ron Wyden, Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, had a chance to position someone else in a place where they would tell us what Wyden was forbidden to tell us. There was a Senate intelligence hearing where Wyden got to question the head of our intelligence, James Clapper. Wyden asked him questions that Wyden already knew the answers to, right? He knew that if Clapper answers these questions truthfully, he will be telling the public what Wyden can't tell the public, right? Remember, Wyden knows this stuff already. He's on the Intelligence Committee. He's trying to warn us about it. So here is the actual, you know, conversation that went on in the Senate chambers, on TV. I mean, everybody saw it. Wyden says, quote, to Clapper, asking Clapper these questions, quote, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? Clapper says, no, sir. A stunned Wyden, right, who's planned this to release this information to the public through Clapper, says it does not. And Clapper says, not wittingly. There are cases where they could inadvertently perhaps collect, but not wittingly, end quote. Now, Clapper had to issue a clarification on June 6th, the day the first of the Guardian stories broke. You know why? Because he was lying. And lying to Congress gets people into trouble, okay? Look at your history, folks, of U.S. scandals and the people in government who are involved in them, okay? Part of what makes me so incredulous at people who tell us that the government's just trying to keep us safe and we need to trust them on all this is that the government isn't like some lily-white, never-convicted-before citizen. They are a repeat criminal offender. Okay, if, if, if somebody shows up in court and you're on a jury and that person has an entirely clean criminal record, you treat them one way. If they come in and they have a rape conviction and an assault with a deadly weapon conviction and, you know, numerous drug charges and trafficking and, I mean, all these things, you treat them differently. The government's track record is horrible on this, ladies and gentlemen. And the people with the horrible track record are actually major players in designing the system we have now. So it's not like you can say, Dan, that was 50 years ago. You know, those people, I mean, it's a different America now. Start with Poindexter. Anyone remember the Admiral, right? Poindexter was one of the main people involved in the Iran-Contra scandal in the middle 1980s. Poindexter was convicted of lying to Congress, of violating this, that, and the other. He should be in jail now. He was forgiven because he violated his own Fifth Amendment rights to self-incrimination, something we don't let terrorists get away with now. But we let Poindexter off on that technicality. He was convicted of lying to Congress about what the government was doing in secret, selling arms for hostages, right, and then diverting the money to a program Congress had already decided to defund and, you know, anyway go back and read on the Iran-Contra thing. The point is, is that Admiral Poindexter was convicted, lying to Congress, all these things. So what happens to a guy like that? Does he ride off into the sunset and we never hear from him again because he's disgraced and you can't trust him in government anymore? No. He goes and works for a private firm, comes back to the government with a program called 
the Total Information Awareness Program which the Bush administration decides they want to use until the sheer scope of this project scares the hell out of everybody. So the Bush administration has to publicly table the idea and say, we're not going to do that. And then they go ahead and do it anyway, rename it. And basically, that's what we have now. Designed and pushed by the guy who should be in jail for all these offenses before in the middle 80s. Folks, these aren't, I mean, we're not talking about an institutional problem which we are, but I mean, just, just an institutional problem. We're talking about the same damn people doing this, okay? I mean, the people who have helped put this into place, you look at the Cheneys, you look at the Rumsfelds, you look at all these guys working for the Bush administration. Folks, these were all low-level people in the Nixon administration who didn't think anything was wrong with what happened in Watergate, as Nixon so famously said when the IRS being used as a weapon was brought up. And he said, you mean we can't use the IRS for politics anymore, as though that was a stupid thing to say? These are the same folks, okay? And yet there are people, a lot of people who trust the government to do this, you know, in a legal and ethical manner that would not violate our rights. Except they've done it already, many times. Go look at your history. Almost swore. Look at your history, folks. These are repeat offenders. These are people that require oversight. And look, the founding fathers of this country who didn't know Admiral Poindexter, but they knew people like him, human beings. They built a system that understood what human nature is like. That's why there's layer upon layer of oversight built into it. What we've been doing, ladies and gentlemen, for almost 40 years now, well, really, I mean, you could almost say since 1947, but I mean, we've been stripping out these protections, these oversights, and replacing them with things that we say do the same jobs as the things we took away, but they don't. By the way, Poindexter was uh, convicted, just because I didn't name the laws, um, on several felony counts of conspiracy, lying to Congress, obstruction of justice, and altering and destroying documents pertinent to the investigation. Okay? Felon. Should be. The point is, is on what grounds should we give these people a trust pass? They have abused that trust over and over and over again. And folks, even if you would trade some freedom for security. What makes you think you can trust our government to do this correctly? Their history documents and demonstrates that they shouldn't be trusted with this power, okay? Now, these intelligence committee members like Diane Feinstein and Saxby Chambliss, these guys are coming out and saying that there's no scandal here. We've been doing this for seven years. It's a mountain out of a molehill. There's nothing to see here, folks. Move on. Let's examine for a minute why they would say that, okay? Understand something. If there is a scandal here, they're part of the cause. If there are investigations, they're the ones who need to be investigated. Like Wyden said in that warning, people are going to say, did you know about this? And most of the Senate and most of the Congress can legitimately say, no, I wasn't on the Intelligence Committee. I, I didn't realize all this was going on. Dianne Feinstein can't say that. She was on the Intelligence Committee. Chambliss can't say that. He was on the Intelligence Committee. See, those people are facing investigation if they're in on this scandal. So it's in their interest to say there is no scandal. What are you even talking about? Nobody was even against this. I mean, my favorite line, Saxby Chambliss, Republican from Georgia, said he didn't know any citizens who registered any complaint about this surveillance. Folks, how could a citizen um, register a complaint about this? They were, for the most part, unaware of it. And the few cases that have come to the courts, you know, based on the assumption that somebody is being targeted have been dismissed on the grounds of standing. Okay, now let's talk about this for a minute because it's, it's a catch-22 that helps make this whole situation that this whistleblower came out to try to help us overturn possible. There's something called judicial review in this country. Programs like this whole post-9-11 security state are supposed to, at a certain time, make it in front of the courts so that the judicial branch of the, of the government can say whether this comports with the Constitution. Our government, the Obama administration, the Bush administration, have all said, listen, all three branches of government have signed off on this. No, they haven't, because the judicial branch is prevented from doing judicial review about this. Do you know why? 
because nobody has any standing. The courts have ruled that in order to have standing, which means you can prove that you were somehow affected by the very thing you're bringing to the attention of the judicial system, right? If you want to say, oh, I've been spied upon and I'm complaining and I want a court ruling on this, you have to be able to prove you were spied upon. But the information that would allow you to prove to the court that you have standing because you were spied upon is classified. So you can't have it. It's a catch-22 that even the courts have recognized. Lower courts um, and circuit courts and appellate courts have actually said, please take this you know, I can't rule for you because you don't have standing, and that's what the law says, but you're obviously caught in a catch-22. Please take this to a higher court, okay? The Supreme Court ruled on one aspect of this recently in a 5-4 to four ruling and pretended, the five justices who ruled, you know, against, pretended like there is no catch-22, and if there is a catch-22, it's an okay catch-22. Here's a story from uh, CNET News by Declan McCullough, February 26, 2013. Uh, entitled Supreme Court Throws Out NSA Surveillance Case. Quote, in a narrow 5-4 to four decision, another 5-4 to four decision, folks, sh shows you how, how obvious some of these decisions are, right? They're completely political and completely contentious. In a 5-4 to four decision, the Supreme Court rejected a lawsuit challenging a secretive National Security Agency surveillance program. A majority of the justices ruled, the story says, that the lawsuit brought by human rights advocates and journalists who believe their electronic communications sent abroad would be intercepted was, quote, too speculative, end quote, to proceed based on fears of, quote, hypothetical future harm, end quote. The plaintiffs, the story says, which included Amnesty International and The Nation magazine, had argued that the 2008 amendments to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, giving the government virtually unregulated authority to perform bulk surveillance on the international communications of U.S. citizens, violates privacy rights protected by the Fourth Amendment. Justice Samuel Alito, who wrote for the majority, endorsed by the court's other conservatives, disagreed, quote, it is speculative whether the government will imminently target communications to which respondents are parties, he wrote. We decline to abandon our usual reluctance to endorse standing theories that rest on speculation about the decisions of independent actors, end quote. The story then quotes the person who wrote for the four-person minority in this case, quote, a dissent written by Justice Stephen Breyer said that the case should have continued because the harm was not speculative. Quote, it is as likely to take place as our most future events that common sense inference and ordinary knowledge of human nature tells us will happen. End quote. Breyer wrote, saying that he was expressing no opinion about whether the Fourth Amendment was violated, but would let the case continue to explore that point. Quote, this court has often found the occurrence of similar future events sufficiently certain to support standing. End quote. An understanding of the technology, the story says, and the NSA's motives to expand its surveillance as much as possible all point to a very strong likelihood that the government will intercept at least some of the plaintiff's communications, he concluded. So there you go, folks. The people who would challenge this and use a key component to American jurisprudence, judicial review, are prevented from doing so by this catch-22 of not being able to prove they were harmed by anything because they don't have the secret documents that they would need to prove that, right? So by keeping this program secret and what's going on, the executive branch is able to keep a judicial review challenge of this entire structure from happening, all right? Now, why don't we, you know, here, here's, here's the key component. If you wanted to do all of this in a constitutionally legal way, why don't you? And the real legal way would be to say something like the Fourth Amendment is too dangerous to keep anymore. That the Fourth Amendment was written in a time before you could fly airplanes into buildings, that, that something like that didn't you know, understand how digital communications were going to go. We simply need to understand we don't live in that kind of world anymore, so we're going to put forward an attempt to repeal an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Why don't they just do that? Because if they did that, nobody could argue the point, right? We would have, everybody would have done it legally. We repealed the fourth as too dangerous, you know, to have, assuming you could repeal a Bill of Rights, right? But, I mean, it's all in there. Um, the, the, the ability to basically change the Constitution and amend it and all those kind of things. Um, we don't get rid of the Fourth Amendment or any of the amendments because we don't have to. We just get rid of them in reality while leaving the shell in place so we can continue to pretend 
that our traditional institutions remain intact. Okay, folks? In other words, we trim, we put in new fig leaves, we take out key protections from earlier legal decisions, and we have a shell corporation instead of a constitution. We have the structure of our ideals still on paper with the guts stripped out, and the FISA court is a perfect example of how that's done. The FISA court, folks, is the United States Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. It is the very element at the key of all these discussions that you hear President Bush talk about, President Obama talk about. The FISA court is, uh, is reviewing all this stuff, and they're the secret court, okay? They were established in 1978 because of revelations that came out of hearings in the mid-1970s about what the government was doing, okay? Out of control. The intelligence agencies didn't want those hearings, and they didn't want the oversight. A compromise behind back doors was reached, and the people in the intelligence community who didn't want oversight put up with the FISA court, which should tell you something right there. Folks, the FISA court is a secret court, okay? The only people who get to present arguments to the FISA court are the government. There is no other person there representing any potential other side. It's supposed to, on paper, oversee requests for surveillance warrants against suspected foreign intelligence agencies inside the U.S. by federal law enforcement agencies, okay? But that's not how we confine its use today because there have been several amendments to this, okay? I mean, uh, one was the Protect America Act in 2007, I believe. I mean, perfect example of how you can take something that seemed logical in 1978, add a few amendments here, strip out a few original clauses there. And again, we have a shell of a FISA Act, which itself was part of creating a fig leaf for reform. And it still can be claimed, listen, we're going through proper judicial channels. So so this is all um, reviewed by a judge. Folks, the FISA court rejected out of almost 2,000 requests that we know about in 2012, none. In its entire history, the FISA court has rejected government requests far less than 1% of the time, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we're not allowed to know what the FISA court is doing, but any oversight committee that is rejecting far less than 1% of the cases brought to it is a rubber stamp agency. It's not an oversight agency, okay? You can divine that by its track record and what little is allowed to leak through to the public, okay? That's not oversight. That's the appearance of oversight. And the Protect America Act of 2007 does away with even the appearance of oversight in some cases. I have a quote here um, from uh, Shane Candidal, who's an American lawyer and writer, and he was uh, part of the Center for Constitutional Rights And he was interviewed on, I think it was Democracy Now! the other day, and he talked about why the FISA court, well, he didn't say it was a joke, but I will. Here's the quote when they asked him about the FISA court and how much it it does the oversight and how much we can trust it to to play the role that both of the last two presidents essentially try to calm our fears by saying it's playing. What this quote by Canadol is saying is uh, talking about the requirement that every 90 days the FISA court renew the government's um, legal authority to suck up all this data, right? So, so, so supposedly every 90 days, the court is supposed to review this and uh, issue another continuation, which they've been, you know, done every 90 days since 9-11. And here's what Candidel says about that, quote, well, we don't know if the Bush administration was, you know, getting these same orders and if this is just a continuation, a renewal order. It's supposed to last for only three months, but they may have been getting one every three months since 2006 or even earlier. You know, when Congress reapproved this authority in 2011, you know, one of the things Congress thought was, well, at least they'll have to present these things to a judge and get some judicial review, and Congress will get some reporting of the total number of orders. But, he continues, When one order covers every single phone record for a massive phone company like Verizon, the reporting that gets to Congress is going to be very hollow. And then, similarly, you know, when the judges on the FISA court are handpicked by the chief justice and the government can go to a judge, as they did here in North Florida, who was appointed by Ronald Reagan and who's 73 years old and is known as a draconian kind of hanging judge in his sentencing, and get some order that's this broad, I think both the judicial review and the congressional oversight checks are very weak, end quote. Folks, 
That's your oversight protection that the government keeps claiming keeps you safe. And here's the fun part. In the very few number of cases where the FISA court has told the government that they disagree with what the government's doing, the government has, a, has an appellate FISA court that they can then appeal to. So it, it's not even the last word. This oversight, if they tell the government no, they can bypass and take it to another one. Folks. It's not oversight. It's the appearance of oversight. Let's play a little logical game to demonstrate that, okay? A little logical game to show how ludicrous this oversight by the FISA court every 90 days is. This idea that the FISA court is playing a you know, watchdog role presupposes that actual thought and consideration and the weighing of circumstances is involved, right? Not just rubber stamping. Folks, can anyone imagine the court not renewing this and having this whole operation grind to a halt? What do you think the government would do if that happened, besides obviously appealing, you know, to the FISA court appellate level? If you can't imagine them deciding that this whole thing has gone too far and it's violating everything and we're going to stop it now, well, then it's just rubber stamping, isn't it? You've got, to, you've got to be able to conceive of them saying at some point, sorry, you can't do this, this is wrong, you've gone too far, for it to have any sort of legitimate oversight ability, right? What a regular court in a non-FISA situation would do, right? If the Supreme Court ruled against something, it stops. We're going to vacate this, uh, this practice has to stop, it's illegal now to... Can you imagine the FISA court saying all this secret government surveillance we got, sorry, it's gone too far, it has to stop? What do you think the government would do? If you can't imagine the FISA court doing that, folks, then it doesn't really have oversight ability. It's just there to give the government a way to say, oh, yeah, we've got the judicial branch on this. The FISA court's ruling on it every 90 days. It's secret. You can't see it. But every 90 days, they have to sign off on it as though they might not. Now, obviously, I read a lot of articles um, before doing this program today, more than I normally read, and I'm reading pieces of articles more than I normally do. I, I like to talk about these things more than reading because I think people's eyes glaze over sometimes. But I think it's important to to read things that help, exp I mean, you know, I hope my credibility has been enhanced somewhat by the fact that these revelations tend to confirm what we've said in the past, but I don't expect you to take me as gospel. I want you to hear a bunch of different viewpoints out there that help flesh out this situation. Um, Lord knows in future shows, I'm sure you'll be hearing from me more than these people, but I, I want this, I, I want to provide some three-dimensionality uh, to this, for lack of a better word. The article that struck me, it's funny because it, it doesn't give you any new revelations. I just love the way he phrased this, was from a Wall Street Journal writer uh, that I read named Al Lewis. And I'm going to read you some of his piece um, that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, June 8th, 2013, entitled, Dirty Bomb Blows Liberty. And I like the way he portrayed it because it kind of shows something we've also told you before, that this is how terrorism is supposed to work. We don't seem to understand that all these things we're doing to combat terrorism is kind of what the terrorists want, you see, the death and destruction that they cause is not the goal. All of our security apparatus is designed with the idea in mind that it is. The death and destruction is a means to an end. Imagine that the country, folks, is like a dog. The terrorist attacks are like fleas biting the dog. But what the terrorists are really after is not to bite the dog. It's to have the dog, in an attempt to get the fleas on him, chew himself to pieces. Here's from Al Lewis in the Wall Street Journal, quote, Here's how terrorism really works. Slaughter people on national television and watch a nation that prides itself on freedom as it shackles itself. The feds at airports start patting privates and taking pictures with cameras that can see through clothes. Security cameras go up everywhere. The spooks in Washington set up massive internet surveillance operations and obtain secret court orders to obtain everyone's phone records. Once it starts, it can't be stopped, he writes. 
In 2007, he says, candidate Barack Obama railed against the, quote, false choice between liberties we cherish and the security we provide. I will provide our intelligence and law enforcement agencies with the tools they need to track and take out the terrorists without undermining the Constitution and our freedom, end quote. Last week, Lewis says, the Guardian newspaper reported that the National Security Agency collected phone records of millions of Verizon customers, and the Obama administration defended the move. The Guardian and Washington Post, Lewis says, also reported that the NSA has a top-secret operation dubbed PRISM, which taps directly into the servers of nine leading Internet companies. Does President Obama know something that Senator Obama did not? Or did the corrosion of our civil liberties take on a life of its own, independent of any elected leader? It's as if a terrorist set off a dirty bomb that is slowly spreading tyranny instead of radiation, end quote, he writes. That's a fantastic mental image, isn't it? A dirty bomb slowly spreading tyranny instead of radiation, and somewhere the ghost of Osama bin Laden laughs, right? Now, Lewis then goes on, writes more about this, and, and, and talks to an expert who tries to explain away this idea that the government also uses, and many proponents of these programs also use, the idea that if you have nothing to hide, what are you afraid of? Quote, some people aren't alarmed, noting they've got nothing to hide. I'm sorry, I should say that this is quoting Mr. Glazer. Um, he's the expert um, on this. Um, Lewis is quoting him in the piece, quote, Some people aren't alarmed, knowing they've got nothing to hide, but they're wrong to think it's normal for the government to monitor law-abiding citizens. There's a reason why our toilets are not in our living rooms, Mr. Glazer said. You're not doing anything wrong when you go to the bathroom, but it's still something you want kept private, end quote. Lewis continues, other people simply feel helpless in the face of authoritarian privacy invasions, whether it's from big government or big corporations. Quote, people are in shock almost about the different ways information about them is being used, Mr. Glazer said. The natural reaction is to just shut down. It's too much to understand and it can't be stopped. End quote. Lewis finishes up, quote, Maybe the outrage over last week's revelations will be enough to start the battle. The war on terror has demolished checks and balances in government. Technology has outpaced Americans' ability to protect civil rights. It's time for patriots to reconsider the Patriot Act before the terrorists win. End quote. Well said. If you're the dog, at what point do you realize you're doing more damage to yourself trying to get the fleas than the fleas are doing to you. And folks, this part that I'm about to get into now is something that's going to be made pretty darn clear, I think, when you hear the little clip we chose from one of our 2006 shows. But it's this idea that we forget that this isn't about partisanship. It's not about what party has the White House. And it's not about personalities, like, well, I trust this guy, but I don't trust that guy. This is about power, the powers of the office. These powers don't go away when the party you trust or the personality you don't fear leave. The powers stay behind for all the future people who get that job. This is Richard Nixon's dream here, folks, just waiting for a really bad roll of the dice for the wrong person to get their hands on all this data and all this infrastructure and all these laws and all this post-9-11 power. When you destroy the constitutional firewalls that protect us, in the name of public safety, you ultimately open the door, folks, to a larger disaster, something far worse than even numerous terrorist attacks. We've lost perspective here. How many terrorist attacks, folks, would you say are okay? How many lives would you say it's worth losing to keep the real ideals behind your constitutional rights protected? How many people would you be willing to lose for that? How many soldiers have we lost for that, right? You go and tell a couple hundred thousand guys who lost their lives in the Second World War who thought they were mostly fighting for freedom and the American way of life and all this, that we're willing to jettison all this stuff for the potential. I, mean, I, I don't, you know, folks, I mean, how many lives? I mean, you put it in that number. I mean, we don't do the draconian things that it would take to stop drunk driving. Right. If you if you were required to take some sort of a sobriety test every time you entered the freeway on a freeway on ramp, we would save 40,000 lives a year or something like that. Why don't we do that? Because that's an overreach. Right. That's an that's that's too much of a violation on, you know, simply life and living to warrant it, even though it would save a ton of lives. We're not making that kind of calculation here. 
How many lives is your freedom, you know, your constitutional rights, as we've always grown to understand them, and as we still celebrate them, how many lives is that worth? And everybody always says the same thing. Well, Dan, if it's your child, uh, you know, what, what would you say? How, how far would you be willing to go for your child? Folks, if it's my child, we'll go right to Hitler, okay? You really want to have a government based on um, you coming up to a, a parent and saying, um, you know, you get this kind of a government or your child dies? You really want to live under that? Because that just takes you right to Hitler land. You go to Godwin's law right away. It can't be that way, folks. You have to think about this in a more logical manner. You know, you hold a gun to my child's head. I'm going to do anything. I'm going to take your freedom. I'm going to throw you in jail. I'm going to give you no rights. You really want that to be the standard? It's funny, too. And again, this is something that the clip at the end of the show will will do a very good job, I think. And that's why we chose it rather than choosing one where I said all this stuff in 2006. You go, Dan was right. But why do you need to hear that? The clip at the end will show, though, this aspect we're starting to see emerge where Republicans who fear Barack Obama are scared about him having all these surveillance powers. And Democrats who fear George Bush are not all of them, obviously, but many of them saying, well, Barack Obama is just trying to keep us safe. And there's also another contingent, and I fully understand this, but we've got to think bigger than this, of people, especially African-Americans out there, who have a lot invested in the first African-American president not being seen badly. I mean, if you finally get somebody in office who looks a little like you and who represents a triumph over discrimination and slavery and bigotry and all these things, wouldn't you back that guy as much as you can no matter what? So I often see a lot of um, tweets and comments and everything where people are saying this is blatant racism and George Bush didn't get held to this standard. And I mean, folks, okay, some of that's true, but don't let that blind you to the bigger reality. When it comes to our civil liberties and protections, this guy's no better than George Bush and George Bush was no better than this guy. Now, a little quote here from William Pitt. And someone tweeted this the other day, but it's one of my favorite quotes because it gets to the heart of this matter. When people say, we need to do this stuff, the government said, we need to do this, right? That's always what they say. Throughout the entire history of the planet, that's what they say. When Hitler was given the Enabling Act in Germany, that's what he said, right? And this was said a couple hundred years ago by William Pitt when he said, quote, necessity is the plea for every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves, end quote. It sounds a little dramatic, doesn't it? It sounds a little tinfoil hat right there, babe, but that's the truth. The people who do these things always say they have to. We don't want to take, we don't want to monitor you. We have to. And we can't have a debate because if we did, the terrorists would know what we're doing. We have to do this. We can't have a debate. You can't be in charge of it. You can't know about it, but just understand there's lots of oversight and all three branches of government are involved. So shut up. I have my own theory about this, folks. And it also helps explain, you know, Dan, if you're not going to do this, what's your answer to how do we keep track of terrorists? How do we, you know, secure the nation and all these things? It's always been my opinion, folks, that this falls into the category of, of, you know, quote, if all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, end quote, kind of, a, kind of an issue, right? The idea that the easiest thing to do when you're facing a problem like how do we defeat international terrorism, how do we protect the homeland, I hate that term, why not just call it the fatherland? Um, the easiest thing to do is to throw the Constitution in the wastebasket, pretend like you didn't, and then just you know ignore all the laws because that's easy. It's a lot harder to sit there and go, okay, how do we get creative and how do we craft real rules that allow us to maintain the ideals of America, realizing that we, even the people in 2001 after the 9-11 attacks who are crafting these rules will not be around forever and very weird, scary, dangerous people down the road may get these powers. How do we protect everybody? I compare it to this. I, I thought of a very bad analogy, so don't criticize me for it. I know it's bad. But I was thinking about rules. And I was thinking about this as though it was a game, right? And you have rules for every game. So say football, right? You have rules for playing football. But what if, what if the game was life or death? And you got behind in the score and things were looking really desperate. And so, you know, you come up to your team and you say, okay, I know that there are rules, but we got to win. We have no choice. So I want you to go get your Ford Explorer, drive it up here. We're going to throw the football in the cab of the Ford Explorer. And you just drive toward that goalpost and you just run over anyone that gets in your way. Well, what is that? You can't do that. That's not even close to the rules. That's a joke. It's just you're totally violating everything. Yeah, but that's the easiest way to score points. And if you stop thinking about the rules, we will score points if you take your car and run over the opposition. And it's a heck of a lot easier to do that 
than to play within the rules, which would require you to do something like, well, let's come up with some new innovative plays. Let's figure out new formations. Let's, you know, even though everybody's thought of these things before, we need to sit down and do the difficult work of trying to find novel ways to stay within the real rules, not the fig leaf rules, to stick to the spirit of the law and not try to hedge on the letter of the law and create new fig leaves that help make it look like we've stayed within the boundaries of the rules when we really haven't. It's a lot harder to do it that way, folks. If all you're armed with is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? When we throw out the rule book, all of a sudden, all of the strategies that we're using violate the rules, okay? So, I mean, it's a lot harder to be creative. It's like saying, gee, if there wasn't a Fourth Amendment, couldn't we get a lot more criminals? If we could go door to door and search everybody's house, couldn't we catch a lot more bad guys? You're darn right you could. But we don't do that for a reason. Because you're Nazi Germany when you do, Okay. So, I mean, it's that same idea. we got to do whatever we need to do to take out terrorists. Well, no, we got to take out terrorists as well as we can without destroying the Constitution while we do it is the better way to think. There was um, an article written in the New Yorker magazine by Seymour Hirsch, investigative reporter Seymour Hirsch, where he was addressing some of these questions that came up in 2006. And he talked um, to a former senior intelligence official who kind of explained this same thing I just talked about, you know, about the tools and the hammers and the, you know, throwing away the rules of the game better than I do. Here's a quote from the piece from the 2006 New Yorker article. We will link to it um, in the show notes. Quote, On May 11th, President Bush responded to the USA Today story, there had been a USA Today story, said, quote, If al-Qaeda or their associates are making calls into the United States or out of the United States, we want to know what they're saying, end quote. The article continues. That is valid, and a well-conceived, properly supervised intercept program, the story says, would be an important asset. Now quoting the senior intelligence official, quote, Nobody disputes the value of the tool, the former senior intelligence official told me. It's the unresolved tension between the operators saying, here's what we can build. And the legal people saying, just because you can build it doesn't mean you can use it, end quote. Hirsch says, it's a tension that the president and his advisors have not even begun to come to terms with. You understand that, folks? Here's what we can build versus just because you can build it doesn't mean you can use it. I'm coming from the side of the issue that says just because you can build it doesn't mean you can use it. And the intelligence oper- operators are the ones who are coming from the here's what we can build and it'll help keep us safe. There's a tension there and we still haven't come to grips with it. And this whistleblower releasing these facts is an example of us beginning to come to grips with it maybe. He said that your information is nowhere near as safe as the government pretends. He could have gotten it. Now... One last thing before I kind of get to the bottom line here. What a long show this is going to be, Ben, but I think it's deserved. Many people, maybe you, try to minimize our concerns about government surveillance by citing how much information private companies, you know, already have on us. The private personal stuff that Facebook and all these kinds of things have on us, right? Amazon. Then they say that the government is simply compiling a lot of this information that's relatively freely available online, right? How can you complain about this, Dan? It's a digital world. They just know more about you, even the private companies. You can't get mad at the government for going and getting you know, information out there private companies have. I would like to point out that this is a separate problem and one that I have long felt and said was out of control as well should have been handled more aggressively from the start. It's far too easy for private entities to use, steal, monitor your information too. You know why they don't have a problem with it? You know why they get away with it? That's connected to our corrupt campaign contribution system and the electoral process that relies on donations. These kind of companies want to be able to spy on you with advertising and cookies and all these different things. They want to be able to do this without forcing you to opt in first. If we were going to do this the right way, you would have to approve all this before they could do a thing. They're giving money to politicians and the people who want you to have to, you know, sign an opt-in agreement first. You know, that really spells out not not one of those five page agreements that's full of fine print that you can't understand that was written by a lawyer, but something that says, can we track you to make your experience better? Click yes. Click no. 
the people that would want that to be the law aren't given any money to legislators or certainly nothing that compares with what the people that don't want to have to do that and want to track you without having to do that are giving. So that's that's a separate issue. But people who say that that's OK, so why isn't this? I don't concede that that's OK. All right. So just just a little bit of that before I get 500 emails saying, Dan, why are you OK with uh, Facebook knowing this about you, but not the government? I'm not OK with Facebook knowing it about me. So, OK, so the bottom line. How many lives saved or lost is it worth to not have this surveillance occurring? Okay. If I say to you, we shouldn't be doing this stuff, we should go dial it back to real idealistic constitutional levels. How many people should we we be willing to lose as the cost of freedom, right? The proverbial cost of freedom. We send soldiers to fight for freedom all the time. They lose their lives. How many of us should be willing to lose our lives because we aren't willing to go farther down the road to ripping up the Constitution to be safe. You know, what's that line from Dwight Eisenhower, Ben? How far can you go to defend yourself from without, without destroying what you're trying to defend from within? The more we go down this road of trying to protect ourselves, the more we destroy the very ideals that make us worth protecting in the first place. Unless you're one of those people that thinks ideals schmeals, it's all about protecting your life. Well, then you're the kind of person that could go live in a totalitarian state and say, hey, well, it sucks, but at least I'm alive. And then you get to this point, and this, this is where I feel very strongly about, folks. Should we, the people, have the right to decide that we don't want this kind of America? Or do we not have that option? And if we don't have that option, who's in charge of things? And people always say, well, Dan, we have that option. We vote. We voted for these people. They're our representatives. They did this in our name. That should be good enough. But you voted for these people without knowing, folks, what's really going on. You know, if you voted for someone today, knowing that all this is going on, might you not vote for someone who promised to turn that around? As I said, we have no guarantees that any of those promises will be kept because, well, we all kind of did. If you voted for Barack Obama, which I didn't, I didn't vote for either of those guys. But if you voted for Barack Obama, you did vote for someone who promised to turn this all around. How'd that work out for you? So how can you really say you had the right to change policy? You voted for a guy to change policy and he just didn't. Like Al Lewis in that article said, you know, why did Senator Obama feel one way about this and President Obama feel another? Also, folks, we buy the line that these people are informed about what's going on. We assume that the Senate and the Congress knows when in reality, out of the entire Senate, eight of them know. And out of those eight, two are totally against all this. But they don't get to tell us because they're not allowed to talk. And they're still only getting the the briefest of briefings. We pretend like they're getting every single scrap of information, and they're not. Folks, here's the real story here, and this is what needs to be acknowledged. The reason that our Constitution in this country and our protections under it are too dangerous or are perceived to be too dangerous to live with as designed, written, intended, whatever you want to say, is because it's a framework intended for peacetime. And we are a nation perpetually at war. Since the Second World War, folks, we've been in a wartime situation, you know, either cold or hot. But in the Cold War, we treated, you know, intelligence as though we were in a wartime situation. We've been in a wartime situation almost constantly. And our founders talked extensively about how liberty and freedom cannot survive perpetual war. It's almost a joke. But two weeks ago, President Obama even used a quote from James Madison the other day before all this whistleblower news broke in the Guardian newspaper. He used the line from James Madison saying, you know, no nation could preserve its freedom in a case of perpetual war. That's what we're in. A constitution that's supposed to be sort of suspended in wartime. It's a peacetime constitution, and it's been suspended since the Second World War, basically, certainly since 1947. It's a little bit ironic, isn't it, that two weeks ago or whatever, the president gave a speech to those Ohio State graduating students that we talked about on the show saying that we should ignore the voices that warned of a fear of government tyranny. Doesn't that sound a little ironic now? Well, here's the sad part to remember about all this, folks. Forget everything else I've said, because here's the sad part. And this is where you need to steal yourselves if you're really convinced, and I'm getting tweets from people now saying, we're going on a march, Dan, would you retweet this? We're going to march in Salt Lake City. We're going to march in New York. 
Great. I think that's all wonderful. I'm all for it. But here's the thing. None of this is probably going to matter much, folks, when the next terror attack occurs. The legislators and the government are going to say, See? This wouldn't have happened if you weren't so bitchy about being spied on. And you will cave, folks, or most Americans will. This is when we need to be tough. This is the proverbial cost of freedom, when we start paying a price in lives and loved ones for it. This is usually the point, as I said, where someone will say, well, damn, what if it's your child? Well, if it's my child, we're all going, you know, to the concentration camps right now to keep my child safe. You want to run a whole country on that basis? I don't think you do. We just have to know terror attacks are a part of life. And what we've forgotten since 9-11 is that they were a part of life even before 9-11, and we existed under the Constitution anyway. At some point, we have to decide what we want in this country, because the freedom versus security trade-off we have now is all security and no freedom. And that's not America. Not as I was brought up to believe it anyway. Audible is the Internet's leading provider of spoken audio entertainment. And we've told you before that spoken audio entertainment seems to be the wave of the future because it shouldn't be too long now before more people read their books with their ears than their eyes. And Audible was ahead of that curve, well, a long time ago because we've been telling you about them now for years. They have more than 100,000 titles in their ever-growing library to choose from, every genre you can think of. They do audiobooks, of course, magazines and periodicals, of course, but you might not expect to find old television and radio shows, stand-up comedy bits, all kinds of things. You know, I'll go on there sometimes to find things to recommend to you, and I'm constantly amazed that this new genre, whatever it might be, has been introduced into audiobook form. You kind of have to go there, check out the site and maybe even ask the person who offers to chat with you. Ask them what they have. They'll show you around and if you go to audible.com forward slash Dan Carlin, you can get your free audiobook download. I might recommend one to you that is particularly germane considering the program you just heard. It's one whose revelations have been confirmed by the recent uh, whistleblower that came out and uh, divulged to The Guardian and Glenn Greenwald what was going on behind the scenes. Stuff that NSA expert author James Bamford has been writing about for years. He is the one who introduced most people to the NSA with his groundbreaking book three decades ago, or whatever it is now, The Puzzle Palace. It's a famous book. Bamford's recent, uh, well, not really even that recent anymore, book on the NSA and what was going on in the post-9-11 world with surveillance and all that kind of stuff, the very same sorts of stories we've just been talking about came out uh, several years ago called The Shadow Factory. We recommended that show quite a long time ago, but if you haven't caught up on what Bamford said you know, in the past, perhaps it's worth catching up on it now, now that we know uh, most, if not all, of what he said in that book was the truth. James Bamford, The Shadow Factory. Update yourself on exactly what's going on with some of this NSA um, surveillance stuff and exactly how big an operation we're talking about here by one of the leading writers on the National Security Agency. And go to www.audiblepodcast.com forward slash Dan Carlin for your free audiobook today. If you think the show you just heard is worth a dollar, Dan and Ben would love to have it. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you can help keep the common sense coming. A buck a show, it's all we ask. Go to dancarlin.com for information on how to donate to the show. All right, here is the promised clip that we talked about in the program. It's not an I told you so uh, so much, because if you listen to this program, you already know that we've talked about these same things forever. And if you've just started listening to this program, well, you have a whole backlog of shows you can listen to uh, where we talk about this stuff. I found this clip more interesting because it's from a long time ago. It goes way back, I think I said 2006 on the show. It really goes back to December. We released this December 20th, 2005. It's uh, show number 27, and we called it Warrantless Eavesdropping and Intellectual Diversity. And this clip I like because it highlights sort of the the point we brought up about how there's a partisanship and personality question involved in this thing that shouldn't be, where if the person who's running this secret, you know, 
backroom surveillance program is somebody from a party you trust or is a person you trust, you're fine and you think they're protecting America. But as soon as this administration changes over and it's not someone you trust or now it is someone you trust, a lot of Americans flip their views on this, not seeming to understand that this isn't a personality or partisanship power. It's a power power. And that when you change the executive branch and give it this power, it goes to whoever gets that job. And the people that are going to get this job in the future could be very scary indeed. Depending on your point of view, you may think that the person who has it now is scary, or you may think the person that used to have it is scary. I think this clip will point out how interesting it is that people who trusted the last president with this power don't trust the current one, and that people that don't trust the current one did trust the last one. So interesting, I think, you know, juxtaposition of ideas based on something that we should consider more something that should unite people on the right and the left and who care about constitutional freedoms rather than divide us based on who gets to wield a particular power at this time. So without further ado, our clip including two bites from then-President George W. Bush from show number 27 from December 20th, 2005, Warrantless Eavesdropping and Intellectual Diversity, and once again, thank you for your support that has kept us around since 2005 to do these kind of shows. We owe you folks. Thank you. Now, where the heck did that have anything to do with wiretaps without warrants? So um, the president is making essentially the same sort of case that Ronald Reagan made and that Lyndon Johnson made and that Nixon made and that at times Clinton made. And that is that the president has the power to just do these things. What was it Nixon said? If the president does it, it's legal. What he meant was it's legal by default. So this is a good subject to have a debate about. And, and the reason that it also matters is, you know, we were having the press conference today. And the president made several points that, that hit me. One is that um, we shouldn't be even talking about this subject. That we're aiding the enemy too much, that when we have these open debates, it alerts al-Qaeda and people like them to our tactics, and they thereby adapt. It was a shameful act for someone to disclose this very important program in time of war. The, the fact that we're discussing this program is uh, helping the enemy. You got to understand, and I hope the American people understand, there is still an enemy that would like to strike the United States of America, and they're very dangerous. And, uh, you know, the discussion about how we try to find them uh, will enable them to adjust. He also had several other subjects about the nature of the enemy and the nature of the threat. He kept saying they killed 3,000 Americans. I have to once again reiterate ladies and gentlemen, that so much of this is based on fear, it's embarrassing me. You know, we come from a pretty proud heritage, and the president is fond of, you know, recalling the imagery of that heritage. We show the old West, we show the brave sort of scenes from our past, but we don't emulate the character of those people. Because, let's be honest, our direct parents and grandparents, and some of us, face down threats that make this look like a mosquito. The Soviet Union had 25,000 or more ballistic missiles aimed at every major American city down to the size of, like, Pahrump. We did disaster drills and hid under, hid under our desk once a month at our school, you know, for that inevitable day. Duck and cover, remember that? The threat before that was the Nazis, who had perhaps the most powerful military in the world at the time, and they were allied to two other countries. Now, we didn't have to get rid of anywhere near the kinds of freedoms we're talking about now in order to fight those wars. But this mosquito of an enemy, who I realize has the potential to do a lot of harm, but any enemy has the potential to do a lot of harm, yet we're willing to make the sort of claims that presidents in other wars wouldn't have made. Now, the president then brought up the issue that we are at war. He brought up his wartime authority a few times. Basically saying, look, we're in a war. I have to do these things to protect the American people. Well, I want to discuss that for a minute because the president is asserting powers that essentially have no end. 
Because this war has no end. The thing about a World War II or a Korea or a Vietnam, when you're asserting wartime authority, and by the way, they didn't assert that much in Vietnam, which is why you saw all those movies and pictures and news coverage and everything else. But when you assert wartime authority, there's an assumption that that will end. You will have a peace treaty signing. Or you will have an armistice or something. But as we said before, there's not going to be a VVE day, a victory over violent extremism day. So when does the wartime authority powers end? If the president is saying he could do what he's doing because it's wartime, when can he stop doing it? At what time is that power ever going to be reverted back to whoever has it now? If anybody should have it now. 50 years from now, somebody's going to give that back? No, it's try telling me that's not a new permanent presidential power if you manage to get away with asserting it's a power at all. Which brings us to that subject. Because if it is a presidential power, it's not just this president's power. And this is why those of you who will, I guess, acquiesce to one of the other tactics the president used in the speech and the press conference this morning, which essentially was a, trust me, I'd never take your civil liberties. I'd never lead you down the wrong path. I would always protect you line. If, that's, if that works with you, and that's, it's understandable, I think a lot of people out there do trust the president. What are you going to do when it isn't this guy? Because these powers that he's talking about, if he can manage to grab them for the executive branch, and I don't hold him you know, at fault for that. I mean, that's what presidents from both parties do. They continually try to expand the power of their branch, and they've been very successful at it since Roosevelt. Uh, if he manages to do this, it will not just be his power. It will outlive him, and the next president and the president after that, and et cetera, will also have this power. Do you conservatives who trust President Bush with this power feel as good about Hillary Clinton wielding it? And if you don't, then you see the problem that those of us who don't have a party have with all of these rules. Is that just because you have someone today you trust with them doesn't mean they're not going to be abused in the future. Part of the problem we have in this whole deal also is that the president is making claims that none of this stuff is being misused or abused in any way. And the problem with that is that when you on one hand, say, we need to keep all this stuff secret because we're helping the enemy. And on the other hand, say, but don't worry, everything's being done on the up and up. You take away any chance we have of having any oversight. And if you're going to say that you get to do this for the entire length of the war, and the war is going to last 50 or 60 years, you're telling me we can't have any oversight for 50 or 60 years, and you're telling me to trust you, but you've only got three years left in office? Do you see the problem I have with this, ladies and gentlemen? It's not an anti-George Bush problem. It's a what are you talking about problem. This country can't operate as a free republic with you making the decisions if you're not allowed to know what's going on. And you would think people that do so much promoting of democracy in the Middle East would understand that that would be an inherent problem, a cancer, on our republic. When George Bush, for example, says, trust me, we're only using this power against al-Qaeda and related terrorist groups. All I'll say is, how do we know? How do we know you're not using it against, you know, domestic eco-terrorists? Or, if you're not doing that today, how do I know you won't do it tomorrow? Or how do I know that Hillary Clinton in four years won't do it against anti-abortion activists? Do you see where I'm going with this, folks? This is a structural problem, and the presidency is trying to take even more power from the other branches of government, which are, well, kind of emasculated now. Now, there is a solution, I think, that would help us a lot. But it totally goes against the grain of, I think, what the president is trying to, t to sort of lead us down. If you recall, in the middle 80s, uh, the president of this country was Ronald Reagan. The president uh, or leader of the Soviet Union at the time, that's what Russia was, was Mikhail Gorbachev. And in the middle 80s, they met at a summit, and Ronald Reagan had a great line that came out of it, the Reykjavik summit. Uh, he was talking about treaties with the Russians. And he says, trust, but verify. And that's how I feel sort of about this whole uh, government secrecy, war on terror, Patriot Act thing. Trust, but verify. But if you have the secrecy, you can't verify. You just have to trust. And I don't know, call me crazy, but you know, you know, the government of the United States, which is something that outlives all the presidents, they just come and go. But this thing that is the government remains has a track record that leads me to believe that 50 or 60 years of no oversight might not be a good thing. That having been said, I have an answer. Like I said, the people around the president and he himself will not like it. 
because his whole press conference this morning was about, well, just the opposite of it. But out of that Reykjavik meeting with Ronald Reagan, Mikhail Gorbachev went back to the Soviet Union, which was starting to come apart at the seams, and came up with a concept they call glasnost, which means openness. And he had the bright idea that if the people could see what the government was doing and the government became more transparent and opened up its secrecy, that shining the light on things would have a redemptive effect. Now, in the Soviet Union's case, the minute they shined the light on things, things got so good they dropped the whole communism thing, see? So he sort of miscalculated, but he was right. He was right. Shining the light on him had a positive effect. It just was so positive that he was out of power. Now, shining the light on things, I think, would have a positive effect for us. I want glasnost here. And I think what I mean by that is let's strip away all this secrecy. I know we think we've got to be monitoring everybody everywhere all the time. But I wonder what would happen if, for the most part, we stopped. I mean, sure, you can still monitor al-Qaeda and whatnot, but this this fear that we have in this country, this, well, most un-American of tendencies, really, when you study our history, is crippling our ability to think about this in any sort of common sense way. We're becoming a paranoid country, and a paranoid country sees no end to threats. Everything becomes a threat. And let's be honest, as I said, This al-Qaeda threat, by 20th century standards, is like a mosquito. And sure, something bad could happen. Maybe something bad will happen. But in the long run, there might be other ways to solve this problem without doing the kind of damage that this level of secrecy and this expanded powers for the presidency will do to the republic over time. And I think that's the question, really, that came out of this press conference with President Bush today is are we going to go down this path of saying that in order to protect us from this threat and the future threats that we may uncover with this extra surveillance and whatnot, we're willing to cede not just the powers that you're asking for, but the ability to monitor how those powers are used. I don't think the Republic can survive that. I think you go back to what James Madison said when he said that long wars are the death of republics. Standing armies create debt. Debt creates taxes. Eventually, it becomes a way for the strong to assert their dominance over the weak. The founding fathers begged us not to go searching for foreign dragons to slay. I'm pretty confident that the republic could withstand a nuclear bomb smuggled in by some terrorist in one of our cities exploding. Pretty confident we could withstand it. But I'm pretty pessimistic about our chances as a republic of surviving prolonged secrecy and expanded government powers over a long period of time against a war with no discernible end. Thank you, Mr. President. I wonder if you can tell us today, sir, um, what, if any, limits you believe there are or should be on the powers of a president during war, at wartime? And if the global war on terror is going to last for decades, as has been forecast, does that mean that we're going to see, therefore, a more or less permanent expansion of the unchecked power of the executive in American society? Uh, first of all, I, I, I disagree with your assertion of unchecked power. Hold, hold for a second, please. Uh, I, uh, there is the check of people being up sworn to uphold the law, for starters. There is oversight. We're, we're talking to Congress all the time. And on this program, to suggest there's unchecked power is not listening to what I'm telling you. I'm telling you we have briefed the United States Congress on this program a dozen times. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, this is an awesome responsibility to make decisions on behalf of the American people. And I understand that, Mayor. And uh, we'll continue to work. Uh, with the Congress, as well as people within our own administration, to constantly monitor a program such as the one I've described to you, to make sure that we're protecting the civil liberties of the United States. To say unchecked power basically is uh, ascribing some kind of dictatorial position to the president, which I strongly reject. Uh, I, I just described limits on this particular program, Peter. And that's what's important for the American people to understand. I am doing what you expect me to do. 
and at the same time safeguarding the civil liberties of the country.